We're ready to begin? Fantastic. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. I love that. Yes, let's do a big, let's start with big claps so we get other other folks to come attend this session, right? Woo! Fantastic. So as I said, we really do want this to be a conversation. Um, we came into the planning of this thinking we were going to have some technology to be able to share with you and show with you and then re realize that we were just a panel that we were going to be talking. So that's why I'm telling you all that there's additional resources and sample assessments on the website that's at the QR code on this card, as well as the new skills visibility paper that Education Design Lab just released. So welcome, so glad you're here with us today. I am excited to be able to share this project with you because basically it is a foundational element in this skills ecosystem that we're talking about. I am joined by this amazing superstar team and they will be introducing themselves in a second, but I've asked them to not only tell you name, title organization, but also to share with you their super skill that is not represented on their resume, that they can't validate on their resume, okay? So I'm Naomi Boyer. I am your moderator today. I'm with Education Design Lab. I'm the executive director for digital transformation. And my super duper skill is I'm highly productive. I don't think that comes across in my basic resume, but I can get stuff done. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Deanna, to introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Deanna Parker. I am a, a Marine Corps veteran, and I am from Syracuse, New York, which many of you already knew that already, because I pointed it out. Um, my super skill, oh, I work at Solutions for Information Design, which was part of this project, and uh, my super skill would be basically creating buy-in um, and persuasive promotion, getting everyone to do what I want them to do but making them think it's them doing it. She's yeah. really good at it, I can tell you that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Naomi and Deanna. Um, I'm Eli Wiseman, and I'm the chief growth officer of an organization called Tailspin. We are a spatial computing platform that is focused on skills assessment and skill building uh, in immersive platforms like VR. Um, in terms of my, my skill that's not on my resume, I'm a relentless wayfinder. Uh, so I will, I will find a way. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Dave McCool. I'm the founder and CEO of Muzzy Lane Software. We uh, are a SaaS platform for building simulations for developing and assessing skills. Uh, and I guess my skill is I can go on site to customers and debug technical problems. Hello all, thank you for uh, joining us today. I'm Sean Murphy, I'm director at Walmart, specifically on the philanthropy team, walmart.org. Uh, and I would say my super skill, um, though some might find it annoying sometimes, I'm very much a system level thinker in everything we do. Um, and so the super skill ultimately is the connecting of dots, right? I'm most often saying, but have you talked to so-and-so? Um, and uh, making those connections to really think about how, how projects can connect and ultimately build systems and not just have individualized uh, kind of approaches. So walmart.org is our, is our funder, and we were extremely, extremely grateful to have Sean here, but he can really do exactly what he told you to, he could do. And I'm gonna provide a little bit of context for you all, both about the lab, who we are, what we do, as well as this project, just to help frame it a little bit. Um, and the skills that you heard everyone talk about is what this is all about. How do we unveil the existing skills that people have and document those in, in a way that can be used as a currency in the marketplace, right? So Education Design Lab is a, is a nonprofit organization and we deal with wicked issues. We co-design pr uh, prototypes that deal with things like affordability and relevance and portability, but most importantly, visibility. And the work that we do um, is, is based upon human-centered design thinking as kind of the basis of what we do, but with equity at the center. And we're gonna be kind of poking it at that equity question as we move forward also. Um, the lab has a competency framework, a 21st century skills, and those are the, the durable skills, powerable, power skills, essential skills. I can keep throwing out these words at you, right? Because 
with all the soft skills that we don't like to call them that because that minimizes them, right? Things like collaboration, critical thinking, yeah, 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 in the back row. Um, all, of, all of those sorts of skills that are so important and we hear from employers and that serves as the bedrock, the foundation of what we're gonna be talking about today. That was the lens that the lab brought to this work and that we were building upon because how do we document those skills? So X credit is all about the validation of lived experience. When you hear X credit, we're not talking about academic credit. I would love for academic partners to come along with us and offer academic credit, but what we're really talking about, how can we give, give value to the lived experiences that people have and have developed so that it becomes tangible for them to use as an opportunity, as to, to provide opportunity to them. Those lived experiences can be gained through formal education, non-formal education, military experience, maybe you're a parenting, gig work. I can keep going through the list of how you might gain these skills, but you, we are all here, we can all do things. And not only can we do these things, but we often might not have to sit in a classroom for a certain number of hours to be able to assess and validate those skills. The work of X credit is how do we validate we're focused on 21st century skills, but we could ask the same question about technical skills in a way that's tangible, performance-based, and real. And that's the exciting work that, that these folks have been doing with me, and I'm glad to see our partner Credley here as well. Pat, give a little wave. Um, we have, an, like I said, an all-star cast that has sort of come together to work on this really foundational. This shifts the script, folks. This changes the way we think about being able to show ourselves in the marketplace. And it's not just me asserting. Self-assertions can be important, but it's a, a validated, verified skill that you can put forward and show to an employer. Okay, so now we're gonna get to the, that was just to give you a little sense of what X credit is. And with that, I'm gonna start with the questions because our first use case was using a military persona. And we are so fortunate to have Deanna here with us today. But the first question I have for you, Deanna, Deanna so validated, validating lived experiences, what does this mean for you from your perspective? And tell us a little bit about your background as you do that. Sure. I, so I, I got my phone up here. I'm not texting. I'm, I'm using it for notes. Otherwise, I'll just go off on tangents and, 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 and a rabbit trail. And, and we have little time. So see, I already did it. Just went off on a rabbit trail. Um, so uh, I'll just tell you, start off a little bit about my experience, um, and that, that will kind of uh, really show why uh, validating these 21st century skills are so important. Uh, but I joined the Marine Corps a little bit later on in life. Um, I did have that formal education previously, but a lot of my peers did not and went through the same experiences that I did, so keep that in mind. Um, I, I moved to, I had an opportunity to move to be the legal chief for a regiment um, uh, in the states here, I'm um, in North Carolina um, at Camp Lejeune. Uh, basically, they found out I had a bachelor's degree, and, and f to put it in so many words, the Marine Corps sees you have a degree; they think you're really good at paperwork and a desk job. So, they put you there. Um, but you know, I, I took it on, um, and, and I thrived there. Um, and I really pulled together um, and developed t a lot of 21st century skills. Um, in, in doing that work, as well as mixed with all the other experience I had in deploying um, on, on, on specific missions that I was mentioning just a little bit earlier, um, you know, dealing with people who are not in my culture, being immersed in another culture, um, you know, uh, empathy, oral communication, critical thinking, all of those things I was pulling together, and I was unknowingly pulling those things together um, and developing those skills. Fast forward eight years, I'm out of the Marine Corps. Um, I took a new position um, at a nonprofit, um, and uh, because of their grant funding that was reduced, um, the, our team of seven, I um, mean, the first three months I was there, our team of seven went down to a team of two. Um, and so, you know, again, I, I was able to actually pull those 21st century skills that I had developed um, a lot of, a lot, during a lot of my time in the military. Uh, and I thrived um, in the first, you know, after the first four months I was there, I was employee of the quarter in the first quarter. Um, and then after six months, I was promoted to manager. 
Um, and I think the biggest point to note is that no one was really aware of the skills that I brought to the table when it came to those t soft skills. I mean, they could pick up a little bit on, on those in the interviews and things like that, but nothing really validated that. You know, those 21st century skills that I gained in the military, you know, helped me thrive in that ambiguity and that time of uncertainty and really just step up and take initiative. Um, I didn't have any certificate. I had no credential. Um, I, uh, nothing that signaled my capability. Um, nothing I could put on my resume um, to signal my true value to, to the employers. And, and, and that's like the, the typical to most military. Um, employers consistently you know, report that 21st century skills is something that they really want um, as some of the top skills that they need, but yet you know, the applicants have a hard time signaling those skills. And I think that's the biggest thing. Um, employers say they want to hire veterans, you know, but they don't, they don't think veterans have the experience to do the job. Um, you know, when, when push comes to shove, a lot of companies. There are some companies that really focus on them. Walmart is one of them. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, so trying to, to find a way to make that transition easier and to validate that was something that would have really been helpful uh, for me. Um, and I think I'll stop there. So that's good. Thank Does you. anyone else want to add in as far as, you know, what does lived experience, validating lived experience mean for you? I would just say you, you said it well, like, yeah. I mean, it's, it really is. And, and in a prior life, I had a chance to work with transitioning military and consistently saw what, what you end up dealing with. And we would see these folks that would transition and ultimately get roles that um, in many cases were not up to what their abilities were. Um, and they were quickly promoted after they got into those roles because there just wasn't a recognition until they got in there. And most often it is those soft skills or um, 21st century skills that, that folks have trouble translating. And, and the ability, what Ed Design Lab and this team up here are really being able to do is really think through very critically um, with, with users in mind, how do you build a system that ultimately can validate those kind of skills uh, and, and to that place, be able to really start recognizing um, those skills early and often and looking at where deficiencies are, right? Looking at those things and being able to really go after those and, and, and grow in ways that can um, make you actually, you know, we talk often, I think especially recently about, we've got these supply challenges with talent. Really it's about matching, right? It's about we're not matching talent to the right folks or the right opportunities. Um, and, and so much of that is because we don't really understand what skills people have um, or what they're lacking that they need to have. So um, exciting work. Thank you. And, and I think the other, the other side of that is I think a lot of those um, learners, earners, don't know they have those skills. So it's not only that they're exactly. not yep. accepted into those jobs, they don't apply to those jobs because they don't know that they have those skills. Just to interject a little bit, I think um, my first experience with the idea of hiring ex-military Right, was someone telling me all the reasons why it was the right thing to do, but not being able to articulate the value. And that was what sort of drew me to this project and our company to the project was because there was a way to articulate the value, right, of this lived experience, right? There's, there's a, I hired a project manager years ago at a digital agency, and um, he called me his first morning of work and he was late. And this is not a good sign, right? He shows up six minutes late, and I said, okay, you're not that late, like six minutes in Los Angeles, to be fair, is not really late, right? And I, he was tired and so apologetic, and I said, Paul, you know, um, I know you just moved to LA, how did you get lost, were there you know, lots of traffic? And he says, no, I took the bus. And I said, where'd you take the bus from? We were in Marina Del Rey. He took the bus from Pasadena to Marina Del Rey, which took him three and a half hours, right? And so he had this quality of relentlessness and commitment to showing up at the right time, got off the bus, found a payphone, this is years ago, found a payphone, called me to tell me he would be late, and walked in the door six minutes late. That's not something I could ever train, and it wasn't something that was articulated in a resume of, of a, you know, a reference and some job references from the military that I didn't quite understand, but a list of skills that were there, but they said things like project management, scheduling, Gantt charts, nothing about the relentless pursuit of trying to get through Los Angeles on a bus system that is terrible, <laughs> to be fair, and taking three and a half hours to get there. And, and there was something there that to me was incredibly valuable that that becomes a currency. 
And, and those types of credentials, I think, are going to be the currency of the sort of future of work that we all sort of point to and, and is really already here. That that type of validated skill, whether you have an advanced degree or not, is the true currency, not the tag cloud types of things that you see on a resume or LinkedIn or things like that. So that's one of the reasons we're so excited about it. What a wonderful story, because mm -hmm. I would want to hire that person for their perseverance, their initiative to call you. I mean, just just amazing. And you've all given me such wonderful tidbits here to, to, to grow off of. And I mentioned that the lab does co-design of prototypes that, that resolve these, or try to resolve these, these wicked issues that we're talking about. And we also focus on what we call the new majority learner, and I should say learner earner. And these are the folks that normal higher education was not designed for. That's 75% of the folks in our systems. These are the folks that need to take a bus to get there, to show up and be present. And we need to be thinking about folks that may not be engaged and enrolled in our higher ed institutions. How do we think about what they know and can do. And then we look at the gaps that they have, and that's where we can fill them, right? And there's something else that was said here too, which is the intentionality and explicitness, because if somebody can express to you the skills they have, it becomes that much more meaningful, because we need to get them through. We can use credentials, digital micro-credentials, which I mentioned the lab has, that we can use those as a signal of what someone knows and can do, may get them through, but when they walk into that interview and they're asked, talk to me a little bit about your oral communication skills, they better be able to talk about it and represent it as part of that process. Now, one of the things that we've done, the deliverables as part of our work on our X credit project, is the development, we have three forms of, of skill validation, we'll say. Um, one is a skill translation, which is You've had this job role and this job title. We worked with Solid to go through and analyze very distinctly. You've, in this certain rank, we kind of put together a formula that said, if you've done X, Y, and Z, check mark, you have this subcompetency, right? And it was a arduous process of going through and analyzing. So we're not saying we're giving anybody anything. We, if they've advanced to this position, they would have that. That's one form of skill validation. The second skill validation form is still very experimental and we're having a lot of dialogue about it. And that is what we're calling skill artifacts. I'm not talking about portfolios because the, the, some of the design criteria as part of this work is that it needs to be digitized and scalable. Portfolios are not digitized and scalable. And so that skill valid, that, that um, artifact piece, we're exploring with things like crowdsourcing platforms and ratings and will value. And we do, as, as Sean said, we do a lot of co-design, which means we've brought employers and veterans and serving military to the table to have dialogue with them to ask, would this matter to you? Would you participate in this process? And we've learned a lot about that. But today's conversation, we're going to focus a little bit more on the third form of skill, skill validation, which is assessments. And I'm not talking about multiple choice ABC, and I'm not talking about um, I think I'm good at, right, self-assessment. Self we're talking about performance-based assessment using next-gen technologies. This is the kind of stuff that I really wanted to show to you and give you the chance to do couldn't do that, that's why you have the cards. Because on the website, if you go to the, the, the websites that are there and go to this session on our website, it'll, it'll allow you to take some of the assessments we're about to talk about. But I'm really interested in hearing both from, from Eli and Dave, um, how is it possible, it's 21st century skills, how the heck can you, can you measure appropriate tone and word choice? How can you measure critical thinking, right? Talk to me a little bit about, about how we could possibly even think about doing that. Uh, sure. Um, I think the best way we can do it is to put you into a real world situation, right? That's what we're talking about with a veteran who we're saying like, okay, I want to assess your skills in a situation I don't understand. And I want to give you some validation and some credential based on how you performed in that situation. And there's no real currency that comes out of that system. And so if we think about a flight simulator is meant to put student pilots in a variety of situations that are unlikely. And they do it that way because it's safe, right? It's a safe place to fail. You can get a deep assessment of every type of action that they take. 
Did they look up? Did they look down? Did they reach for this? Did they reach for that? Did they speak clearly, right? Was their heart rate elevated? Those are all of the benefits that you're gonna get from a real world type of simulation. And so what Tailspin's view is about this is that you can simulate conversations in such a way that they are emotionally believable, right? That they have an impact on you and that they put you in a position of making choices that demonstrate wherever you get the experience from actually doesn't matter. What we're interested in is your ability to perform in a situation where you have to answer someone, where you have to solve their problem. So if you take somebody who was a great Uber driver who could find his way through a city incredibly well and was a great problem solver, is that person suited for perhaps a different job where problem solving, where situational awareness and where communication were key? Our belief is that you, you can do that and that it's incredibly important to work with folks like the Education Design Lab and subject matter experts at the important sort of learning objectives and key skills and competencies in that type of, of system. So I'm a big believer in these sort of superpowers of immersive learning because it gives you the ability to practice in a safe place. I mean, think about, you know, one of our first clients was an insurance company who asked us to simulate a series of conversations. Great. The way they were doing it was hiring live actors that you would sit across from and you got 20 minutes at it and you would do this sort of stilted role play with a person who was playing the role of a frustrated customer. Not scalable. Not scalable. <laughs> and they shut it down in COVID. That particular client trained 12,000 people a year that way. So you have to do it at distance. So you hire actors to sit on Zoom, not scalable, right? Costly, infrastructure is challenging. And so big believer in those superpowers of immersive learning being, a, the, sort of being able to deliver it at distance, being able to have, and we did a study with PwC about this, to be able to have the emotional gravity so that you are making authentic choices, mm -hmm. right? You are using your gut to, to, to handle an angry customer. What's your reaction? How are you gonna perform? How are you gonna do it? You, then you can assess their tone of voice. And ultimately, you know, this project is about assessing those skills on a very granular level, down to the subcomp level. Even more granular than that is to look at where in this conversation they could have made a different choice. And then rank that so that they can ultimately become better at that. And so I think the assessment side is really key to assessing and learning right in the sort of flow of work and the, the sort of powers of immersive simulations like this are, are really the way to achieve what we're trying to do here. Fantastic. Had a Rosencrantz mm -hmm. and Guildenstern moment there. You know, there must have been a moment. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't even seen the movie. Yeah. Very funny. Uh, I agree with what Eli said. I think it's about context. Um, you know, what makes, if you're gonna do structured interactions, whether they're multiple choice, fill in the blank, select all that apply, what changes them from being just sort of content retention or, you know, regurgitation into something more? And I think it's context. So. You're put into a role, uh, you're analyzing financial statements, you're interviewing um, unreliable stakeholders, uh, you're make, doing a make versus buy decision. So you've got a pretty big open-ended goal that you're trying to get to, um, and you've got a bunch of structured interactions and how you get there, and that goes to the sort of, that's scalable, right? So that can be auto-assessed, and, and you can get feedback along the way, and you know techniques that, you know, it's, it's been good working with the lab for a couple of years on this, because sort of figuring out what our best practice is, you know. So a question that asks you what question you should ask next is better than a question that just asks you to recall a fact, for example. So that now, now you have to think and you have to process and kind of synthesize a little bit to, to get there. And then I think that the last piece for me is transfer. And that's, I think, what we're trying to learn is how to make sure these things transfer. Flight sims have been proven to transfer. They're, they're validated. Um, you know, how do we make sure that the simulations that we build and actually deliver as part of these skills-based programs transfer to the real skill? So I want to point out, I'm sitting up here with three tech vendors, two of which potentially could be competitors, they're both different assessment mm -hmm. organizations that are working together to solve these difficult issues. It's gonna take us all folks, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a limited space. And I'm just, I told you these are folks are superstars, right? And, and just amazing, and I'm so blessed to have the opportunity to work with a really diverse group of tech individuals that have come forward and are, we're a lab, we're testing, we're trying, we're exploring, we're trying to make things work. And these folks come, have come forward and, and said they're willing to do so. So Sean, my next question's for you. How does this validation of existing skills relate to equity and life improvements for frontline workers, which I know is really upfront and central for you? Yeah, no, great question. Y you know, I mean, 
I've said this a lot over the last few days and, and leading up to this, this conference, um, is that you know, we already have a skills-based system, right? We already have one today. So everyone that's running around saying we should build a skills-based system, we already have one. The problem is with the one we have today is the access points and the growth points in that skill system is very limited. It's what's the pedigree of your school and who's in your network. When we think about moving to a skills or updating the skills system that we have today, it's not about getting rid of degrees. I think that was some of the dialogue in the, in the past of like, let's, let's move to a skills system, not degrees. Degrees will continue to be an integral part of what our system needs in the future. But what we're talking about today is how do you expand out the routes? How do you expand out and, and build multiple pathways for folks in their growth? Because at the end of the day, you know, 32.5% of the population in the US has a degree. That means everyone else has gone a different route. And we also know for all those folks that got degrees, most of which got them in that first few years of, of adulthood, or maybe adulthood, um, and then at that point, it, it has given you access, right, to opportunities and access to networks and growth from there. And then at that point, we're all in the same boat for the most part, right? Some of us will go on for, for higher level degrees. But what we're talking about here is that ability to ultimately say, how do you validate all of those skills that we're all learning through so many different routes? Um, and, and this impacts all of us, right? is that all of us that have gone on to that path to say get a degree and move on um, into your career, most of us still haven't validated a lot of the skills we're talking about, right? So that's where it's so important about this work. And when we think about frontline workforce, you know, Walmart has 1.5 million employees in the US, 2.5 million globally, um, you know, and, and another important data point to think about is that 75% of our managers and our stores, clubs, and in the, in the supply chain management level have all come from hourly. Some of them have gone on to get degrees, but many of them have been promoted because of their, their experience, because of what they've shown on the job. And so what we're really looking at internally at Walmart is how do you really bring learning to the individual? And that's again what I think is so important about this work is it's thinking about how do you bring validation of what you know to where you're at, right? How do you, how do you validate those, those skills you've learned on the job in a way that is not just me saying I know how to do this, but is, but is, and it's not just you know, Naomi saying that I know how to do this because you know, we worked together for a while and she, she likes me and has met my He kids. gets a check mark there. Yeah, he gets that check mark. I mean, that's a, that's a value add, but it's still not a neutral stakeholder in this to say what my skills are. And so I think that's as we think about this from Walmart's end and what we're trying to invest in, not in, in a way that will just help our associates, but help everyone in our workforce system, is truly how do you think about your learning throughout your life and how and bring that learning to people where they're at and allow for the multiple pathways. And then you can do all the other cool stuff, which is understand what, what your skill gaps are and all those other things where you can invest your time and grow as an individual um, and know those paths to get there. Hopefully that helps. Fantastic. Okay. So it's not about uh, degree pedigree or social networks. That doesn't mean that you might not have a degree. But if we can make skills visible, whether you gained it through formal education and learning or through life experiences, it's making those skills visible and tangible. There's a digital component of this. This is really important, and we've heard it throughout all of the sessions that we've been, we've been attending um, the last few days. And so that becomes really tangible work that we need to think about how we make it universally accessible by everybody. Right. I promised you all you would have a chance to ask us questions as well. So get them ready because I'm going to pose one more question to the group and then, and then we'll, we'll go into that. But one thing that, that we grapple with, and I think we've all kind of talked about um, in, in, our, in our, our project meetings, is really whether employers, businesses, organizations will value the resulting digital micro-credentials that come out of this, right? Is it going to matter? Are they going to recognize them? 
we get we, we fill our learning wallet with digital micro credentials. Will those employers really recognize those? And that's something that I'm interested to hear the panel's perspective on. But also, how are we establishing assessment validity so that the results can be trusted? Because we heard in our employer sessions, we call them employer studios, that they care about the bias behind the assessments. They care about the assessment validity and reliability. They care about user testing. I mean, really in-depth questions as to how you map all of this to say that this credential really means that. So do you guys think this is gonna to matter to employers? Will they embrace it? I'll jump in first and, and I'll say that you know, I earlier said, uh, you know, part of my superpower or, or super skill is connecting the dots. And, and this work that's happening here is an integral part of what we're trying to build as an overall system. Um, and that, you know, one of the things, and we've talked about it amongst the team here, is that we can't just build a badge that says, I know good communication, um, and then hope the world. Then we go one by one to every single employer in the world saying, hey, this is a cool badge. You should hire people based on this badge, right? That's not going to work. You have to build the infrastructure as well that aligns with this system um, that they're building here that you can ultimately, as an employer, be able to have machine-readable data behind that in an interoperable way that that information can be handed over to an employer to ultimately see the transparency of what's behind that, right? Because again, unless we teach everyone that Ed Design Lab is such a cool place to work and does really cool work, mm -hmm. and these organizations up here are great companies, you should just trust them. That doesn't work, right? It's about that interoperability, it's about the transparency, and it's about providing that, to a, a, that data to a user in a way that they can own, have ownership of that and share that with employers. And those are kind of the capabilities that are gonna need, be needed to ultimately get to a place that employers will truly value what this is, is, is when you can build out that currency system. I'd just like to say, I think, you know, when we're thinking about validation, right, what's interesting that we, that I, I was, I attended, I was able to attend a couple of the employer studios with, with, uh, that EDL held um, throughout this project. And, you know, one of the things that they really took importance over was a resume, right? Well, a resume is so easily manipulated. I could put so many things on that resume that aren't true about myself, but that's what they consider, oh, that's what a lot of employers consider, like, the platform for, Validation is a resume that can be manipulated by a user. And a digital credential can't be manipulated by myself. If I've, if I've shown and I've, been, I've taken the assessments, it's been validated, I have that credential, mm -hmm. I can't go back in and manipulate that. That's been validated. And so I think it's really important to think, and I also think it just completely levels the playing field when we're talking about equity. I mean, for, you know, for, for those who, who don't, who are in a situation where they don't have money to go to college and gain the skills that way um, and have to do, use life experiences through on-the-job training. For veterans who choose, or active duty service members who choose to join the military versus starting their career, uh, civilian career, you know, it levels the playing field for everyone. Um, they, they will be the new currency. <laughs> We're gonna have an entirely different conversation 10 years from now at this conference, um, probably like, how do, how do we contain all these skills now? They're, everybody's you know, competing against each other for these jobs and they're, and they're recognized on a level playing field. So just like keeping that in mind, um, changing the, the mindset of employers to something that's so easily manipulated, um, like, a, like a resume is, what they, is what's held to, as, the, to, as the standard for what's needed. Why? Because it's tradition, most likely. One of the things that I think is really important is this idea of this currency that continues to come up and validation. And it's sort of built for an idea of, of the blockchain of skills, right? So when we get to a place where there is a way to quantify the experience that that individual went through that is somehow meets a certain level um, that is then accredited as a currency, right? It's sort of like you're, you're beginning to mint these skills and you're, you're sort of proving them based on the individual's performance in this case and then validate them and then also be able to hold them in a skills wallet and distribute them. But I think, Sean, as you said, this is an ecosystem-wide approach that is gonna be really slow. And, and the idea is that skills-based training is there. You know, all of these things sort of exist today, but the reality is they haven't been widely adopted, mm -hmm. right? And, and so we're seeing some organizations say, you know, we're, we're, we're a bit confused because we're not actually sure what the skills of are this individual worker. We have a job description. It's not the skills that are important to that job. If you go to the SME who does a particular job, oftentimes 
in our work, we find out that the skills are entirely different. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like when they take the manual on the first day of a, you know, a skilled tradesperson and they say, yeah, leave that in the truck. Let me show you what the job really is. Right? And those are those moments where even in the hard skills where we start to take a look at that side of things, you know, we're starting to see that soft skills, sorry to use the word, but those types of communication <laughs> skills are the most important to those employers as well. And one of the employer studio participants that we worked with on this project said that very thing. And I think it was like EMT training and a fireman from Arizona um, who said, look, I can train you on the process of getting the hose off the truck and up the stairs and to put out the fire. I can't train you to be situationally aware, to pay attention to the people around you, to communicate effectively and know when to get out of the building, yep. right? I can tell you the process for making the decision, it's too late. And so they are also looking for those types of skills. And, and I think as the, the more they demand it and the more companies like us try to help them build those and assess those things, um, it, it'll start to sort of rise that tide. But you know, the resume is not dead just yet. I just think there's gonna be some, some better stamps at the bottom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think it's interesting. It's, it's, Wild West comes up a lot talking about this whole skills-based uh, thing that's happening or, or transitioning. Um, we have to build an accreditation equivalent on the fly as this is all coming out. Uh, I heard yesterday, someone said that I guess Grow with Google they said 150 to 200 companies now accept those certificates as proof of skill. Um, I took the project management course. It's videos, it's PDFs, and it's multiple choice tests. So I think we can do better. You know, I think someone said to me at South by Southwest, if we're going to build skills-based sort of training and assessment, shouldn't the courses look different? And I think they should. So I think that's what we're looking forward to. Fantastic. So we have a question in the back. I see hands coming up. Oh, I love this. I'm so excited. All right. <laughs> we'll start with you. And I'm going to repeat that for the video. I'm not going to do the whole thing. I'm, I'm, mere, I'm merely going to say that I, the, the question, I think, in summarizing it, is have we seen anything in assessments that will truly get down to, to, to validating the skills and give it with a sense of trust? Yeah. We're glad you asked that question. Yeah, right. I mean, there's a few human in the loop things out there that are doing that today pretty well. I think Mersion does it pretty well for some of the, uh, the communication skills, interpersonal skills. Um, I think there's some online sort of group project stuff that's part of some of the online courses. I think it's hard to do it without a human in the loop, and I think that's what we're trying to, to get to. And I think that the idea of a human in the loop is, you know, when we're talking about using these types of technologies, there's humans behind the learning objectives. The learning designers are still there. Like, when, yeah. I know this probably happens to you. When we go in and we pitch companies and we're talking to them about this, we're not trying to remove the learning designer from the equation by any step of the imagination. What we're trying to do is give them a better way yeah. where they can then count skill points, they can attribute those to a competency, they can add those up to something that is stackable for something they need in their business. And that's the place where I think there's a turning point for learning designers who can say, oh wait, this is a way for me to actually find a way to a bit deeper information about my learner and then adapt my content right, over yeah, time. Giving them tools and best practices and starting points and saying, but you're like you said, they're still in the loop as far as the, the outcomes. Absolutely, we need them more than ever. The SMEs are the most important part of this. And I will say we're moving into user testing, bias review, and when we run into pilots, because we're gonna be rolling out, we've got phase two, thank you, walmart.org. Um, phase two of our funding will allow us to pilot and bring in enough uh, responses so that we can do validity and reliability testing as well. Okay, I'm just gonna have to pick. <laughs> Yeah, just 
I mean, real quick on, on how do we understand the proficiency level uh, of a skill, right? I mean, I, I think that's, that's really going to be that secret sauce as this development continues is, is really thinking through, because the level of communication that's required for my role versus Doug McMillan, our CEO, is going to be a whole lot different, right? And it is going to be different company to company in some of that, and it's going to be different depending on if I'm, I'm focused on philanthropy versus whether I'm focused on you know fixing the internet in my house, right? Um, and so it is going to be different, and I think that's part of the development work that has to happen, that has to have start now, and, and I think this group is thinking about that. Yeah, I think context matters, and the, the example I always people always use is, you know, communication for a nurse doing rounds in a hospital is very different from communication required from a software engineer doing a code review, for example. Which is why we have to make it easy for them to contextualize the work, mm -hmm. right? And, and what I would say is part of that is what I said earlier on transparency. Part is, is the fact that behind the, the badge that ultimately is the pretty front that you get and see, right, is the information behind that and the systems to be able to read that are going to be truly important to all of this because you have to be transparent because some of this is going to be very specific to um, an industry and others are going to be more generic and being able to read that behind the system um, that is in place is going to be key. So our little clock here says our time is up. And I'm very grateful for all of you being here. I think we can stick around for a little bit and answer questions. I know there are many more questions. We'd love to engage with you. Um, and I was going to repeat that last question for the camera, but I'm not going to worry about it now because we're already at a time. I, I think we'll, we'll all pop outside, yeah. and we can get questions outside the room. Yeah. Thank you.